The popularity of the annual Bedford Gathering in Cambridge has increased year on year, so much so that there are now hundreds of vehicles on display. Whatever the model, if it rolled off the Vauxhall Motors production line, then you're sure to see an example here. However, there seems to be one anomaly. That is, the distinct lack of the TM range of trucks produced by Bedford. There was only one example at each of the last two shows, which is surprising, considering the TM series was such a significant model from Bedford's history. The TM launched Bedford into the heavyweight league of trucks, which at that time had a maximum gross train weight of 32 tonnes. Their first 32-ton truck was the KM series, which had a modified TK cab with a Detroit diesel shoehorned underneath it. It was a stopgap until the TM arrived, and arrive it did. There was no compromise on this new addition to the Bedford range. It was big, square, and beautiful. It was monstrous, and there was now an official Bedford sleeper cab. No more sleeping on the back shelf in a TK. Bedford's marketing campaign introduced the new TM range as the Muscle Trucks. Surely it couldn't go wrong with such a comfortable and spacious cab. However, our great British haulage industry is a very fickle one, and although the TMs featured in many fleets, it never really made it to pole position although throughout its production run, it remained a competent competitor. The TM was produced by the thousands from 1974 until 1986, so where have they all gone? Well, there are still thousands in use with the military services, and many are still used as recovery vehicles. But as we said, there seems to be a distinct lack of them in preservation. However, we found three six-wheel tippers that are not only intact, but are still in daily use, running at 26 tons. There is a surprise in store, though. All is not what it seems with these trucks. Ken Hamilton and his son Peter have a Cummins L10 engine in their TM six-wheeler, which was new in 1984. While down in Somerset, Chris Herbert runs a Detroit-powered 1979 model and his son Alan, a Cummins-powered 1986 model. They all have leaf suspension and double-drive Eaton rear axles. Ken Hamilton is based in Chelford, Cheshire, which lies within the shadow of the Jodrell Bank telescope. He's about to fill up, ready for his first load of the day. Ken hauls sand for Bathgate Silica Sand Limited from their Arklid sand quarry, which is just a short run from his base.
like he's seeing these coming. Sometimes he just gets on a walkie talkie thing and gives him a shout, that's the up there, so I'm just going back to there. It doesn't take many minutes for the loader to drop 16 tons into the TM's body. All Ken has to do now is weigh off and find a space to sheet up in the busy quarry. have noticed the A-Series ERF. It's used to shunt sand from the storage bins when they get too full. There is a sister vehicle to this, which was still running out of here up to three years ago. We missed that one, unfortunately. Ken normally operates locally, and today is typical. We're on our way to a builder's yard on the edge of the High Peak District. before the Cummins is working hard on this climb out of Congleton. The Bedford engineers were generous with the power of their old tens. Ken reckons it's 260 brake horsepower, so he's soon going up through the box again.
the weather doesn't look too promising. Thankfully, Bedfords have always had good heating systems, so we'll have no problems in that department. We're just about to join the A6 trunk road here. This is the main feeder route from the stone quarries up in the Derbyshire hills and has a constant stream of trucks on it. This is one road that has not had the benefit of a motorway upgrade yet. That is until you hit the Manchester M60 ring road. Ken spots the brick lorry reversing to come out, so he hangs fire to let him through.
can usually take some more direct route back to the quarry, which cuts out the busy A6 route. It takes us back over the high peaks, which is okay when traveling empty. It's much shorter to come back this way, but it's a bit heavy going in going with the load of ways, it's the other way. It's not a too far, but it's much easier on yeah. the you know. I wouldn't think you've saved anything. As Ken says, this road is okay travelling empty, but it does need plenty of consideration at this time of year. The lower temperatures on the hilltops can leave ice lingering all through the day. And, as you can see, snow remains long after the initial falls. It's on roads like these that you find out whether the truck designers have got the ride qualities and road holding right. It's nice to be able to put your foot on the brakes and be confident that you have control of the braking and not some all-on or all-off valve somewhere down on the chassis. It's also nice to have a rear suspension that keeps the rear axles firmly planted on the road, especially in these damp conditions. It's these kind of qualities that endear you to a truck. Maybe that's why Ken has run the TM for so long. As Ken says, the loader driver shows his skill by accurately judging the amount of sand for each size of vehicle, which can save a lot of time. You can see the extra amount needed for Ken's 16 tons worth.
Now let's see. Ken's truck is 18 years old, times 25 tons, twice a day or more. That's ooh, an awful lot of sand anyway. And the TM is still coping effortlessly. That tanker is there a bit, I'll let uh... As you can see, it's a busy quarry. Arklid Transport is a subsidiary company of Bathgates and has been 100% Foden for many years. The weather seems better for our second run, which by pure coincidence is back to the Peak District. If you hadn't noticed, Ken's one of the old school, who changes gear without using the clutch, as he explains. From here, it's only a couple of miles to the delivery point, but it's a steep climb and requires a block change down as this tight bend drags the speed right down.
Nice Manchester back there in the distance. Opening and stowing the sheeting is the hardest part of Ken's day, really. There are many quarries that now stipulate the use of easy sheets, and Ken informs us that reversing cameras are not very far off being made compulsory too. It's a worthwhile safety feature, but for a small outfit like Ken's, it's a major cost and maintenance problem. Ken's power takeoff switch is mounted on the dash, which is handy. This has been a regular delivery over the years for Ken, so you can appreciate the TM has not had a particularly easy time of it.
Well, it's time to head for home by way of another interesting route. Good working knowledge of the route helps, especially when you need to park up for some fags. Today has been a typical day for Ken, as he explains. As we come to the end of the day, we'll spare you the local rush hour and let the sun set across the Cheshire Plain. Now it's time to visit Somerset, where we join Chris Herbert and his Detroit-powered TM. There's no mistaking the unique sound of a Detroit stroker. Chris is doing his bit for the environment by delivering shredded tyres to riding arenas across the southwest of England. Although this loader is half the size of the one up in Cheshire, it still does the trick. As you can see, Chris needs the extension boards as the loads bulk out more than weigh out. Chris is nearly loaded as the London Express leaves with the morning commuters.
Well, with everything secured, there's just a short drive down to the local way bridge. in Chris's TM has the same shift pattern as Ken's gearbox, although the Detroit has a lighter 9609 fuller gearbox, as opposed to Ken's heavy-duty 11609 type. Ken assures us that the Detroit thrives on being driven into the red sector on the rev counter. He should know he's got plenty of experience having driven the TM since new.
probably. Um, I got around about 14 tons on that, so it's quite light. So what are you grossing? Gross? I'd be um, around about 23, 23 ton gross. I can go up to 25.610. With 335 brake horsepower, Chris's TM is soon pushing this Scania up from the cider factory in Shepton Mallet. leave Chris to deliver his load, but rejoin him once again at his home base.
Chris is about to reveal the secrets behind the Herbert fleet, as all is not what it seems. Not the original engine. The original engine was a 71 series Detroit. This is a 92 series. The first one I had didn't have a turbo on it, but it was a two-stroke Detroit diesel. This one has now got the turbo on it. The first one was 212 horsepower. This one is 335 plus the turbo, which makes quite a bit of difference. And that's over half as much power again. I bought the engine. Originally it was in an Arctic unit. And somebody made it into a four-wheeler tipper, but didn't never use it on the road. And they rang me up and asked me if I wanted to buy it. So we went down to Dorset near Crewkern and uh, bought the complete lorry with the engine in. When we changed this engine over from the other one, of course the other one didn't have a turbo. And the twin exhaust, this one and the other other side, came down into a single pipe, joined a single pipe and then into the silencer box down there. But because this one's got a turbo, both pipes go into the turbo first and then you've got just one pipe coming down down there which, which needed quite a bit of plumbing to fit it properly down there. We had a bit of welding and cutting and different things but we did manage to get over the problem in the end. The original engine I would think lasted approximately 15 years and the crankshaft snapped on it okay. on the M5 down near Taunton. Now I didn't want to scrap the lorry and uh, we bought this cab, this is not the original cab, and the other one was a narrow cab, this is the wide cab, the other one only had two wipers, whereas this cab's got three wipers due to the wider windscreen, the other one had a step on here, as you can see this one hasn't. We got the cab down Bournemouth in the scrapyard and noticed they had an engine there like the original one I had. Yeah, so we bought the cab at the scrapyard at Bournemouth and we noticed they had another engine there on the ground outside in all the weather. So when the crankshaft went on with the original engine, they rang up to see if they wanted to sell it. And they said, yes, we want £500 for it. So I set off, got the Land Rover and my trailer to go and get it to Bournemouth, which is about 70 miles. And just as I was set off, my wife came out and said, oh, the scrapyard's just rang up, say the engine won't turn over. So I thought, well, i got to have something, so I went on down there and, and uh, managed to buy the engine for £125, complete with starter motor and everything on it. So I brought it home and uh, we discovered that it had some rust on one of the liners and it was stopping the piston going up and down. So I then took the engine to Cardiff, to Hewitt's, the Detroit dealers, and uh, they put, fitted another piston liner for me, and that cost about £650. I then had a good engine for around about, well, less than a thousand pounds, including the running about. So um, my son and I then fitted that engine in, and it went on for about four years. And then uh, we had a problem with it, I can't quite remember what it was now. Anyway, we decided to put this bigger engine in, so we took that one out, and that's when we fitted this engine, and that's been in there about three years now, I would think. It's been very good, very reliable, no problem at all. What about fuel consumption, is, is that...? Oh, uh, the other... The 212 horsepower engine that was in it before would do around about 8.5 to 9 miles to the gallon. I thought I was going to have big problems with this being a bigger engine using more fuel, but uh, it's proved to be doing exactly the same. But it does depend on how you drive the lorry. If you drive it hard, then it won't do 8 or 9 to the gallon. It's down to about seven and a half, something like that. Which is unlike the Cummins, which does 10 to 11 miles to the gallon, which is much better.
there are yet more innovations. But when we fitted this engine from the other lorry, because we didn't fit the gearbox with it, we had to do quite a few alterations in here to get this to work, because on the other lorry, the gearbox lever came out alongside here and up beside the engine to the gear stick. But we couldn't do that because of the, because of the original gearbox left in here. So we had to alter all this so it would work up through that turbo there. It works very well now. Everybody said we wouldn't manage to do it, but we got over the problem. Well, my son did anyway, Alan. He, he got over it and it works quite well. When we fitted this wide cap, it was a bit difficult to do it because it wasn't exactly the same as a narrow cab fitting was. It wasn't like this bracket. This bracket here, we had to make one up this side and one the other side, to raise it up to get it to fit properly. But it's all alright now. And look. Another problem we had when we fitted this cab was uh, the gear stick hole where the gear stick goes up into the cab had to be moved over to the right to allow the gear stick to go up in because the other lorry it must have came off of uh, had gone further over that way well that was another problem we had with it we also have a lot of problems with the water pipe that comes down from here down around to here the it was made up of bits of metal and rubber it's original it was original and the metal used to used to rush through and they used to get water squirting out in pinholes sort of thing in the sort of jets so they took all that off done away with it and this piece of rubber you can see here is off of a Volvo and it fits just right it went straight on fitted that end and that end even though they're different sizes and it's a much better job uh, this is the lorry I bought with the engine in uh, that I've got in my lorry now which is the, the 92 series engine Detroit two-stroke turbo. As you can see, it's 335 horsepower. And the way we're at it before, put lethal weapon on the front, which I should imagine it would have been in a four-wheeler. But this one started off life as a an Arctic unit, and they made it into a four-wheeler tipper. But didn't ever use it. We parted it up, and I bought it off of them for the engine. And we got a lot of other parts off of it as well. So that's been a good buy really and there's a lot of parts left on it as well if we want some more. Chris tells us that he's not allowed in his son Alan's cab. As you can see, it's immaculate inside. He made all this. We've got, as you can see, we've got no workshop. We do everything outside. Mm. Um, I'll show you what else we did in a minute. Well, I'm still running the old bag first because, uh, well, obviously I like them. There's something different, not many about, and they got a bit of character to them. And I think they're a very good lorry and a bit ahead of their time, really. And uh, they're very economical to run and don't get many problems at all. Mainly because my son and I drive them, don't have any drivers on them, who might wreck them or whatever. And uh, 
very easy to get through the MOT. We don't, usually the things we do for the MOT is uh, rear brake expanders, they get dry and the line and dust get in them. We have to take all them off and clean them up and lubricate them and put them back on. Probably reline the brakes once a year. And uh, the road spring bushes, the shackle pin bushes, they wear out. They've got to be all renewed every year. And probably the kingpin bushes. And perhaps a set of kingpins every two to three years. But apart from that, we're quite trouble free. Not only does Chris's truck rely on Volvo parts, it even has some Leyland Octopus heritage so, uh, attached to it. Now this chipper body is all aluminium. Originally it started out on a 1971 Leyland Octopus, which was an eight-wheeler. That's the name Octopus. And, uh, it's, it's 28 cubic yards. And uh, we put it on this lorry when the lorry was new in 1979. So the body is actually 31 years old. And about three years ago, around about 1998, I had to have a new floor put in it because we tipped so many loads it wore the floor away. So I only had it put in from the back because the front floor wears out because the load doesn't float over it too much. So uh, now it's made it a good body count. back end of all three TMs are double drive Eaton's with simple leaf suspension. Have you got cross diff locks and everything? Yeah, it's got diff locks. Not cross diff locks, just straightforward diff lock. Do you have to use those? Um, when you're delivering two rolling wheels, they're usually across cross fields, so I find that very handy. Just normal leaf suspension, is it? Yeah, it's just leaf suspension, it's just got one shackle pin and bolt at this end and a slider that end, which is on a rocker arm here. The original rocker arm bushes in there used to be made up of rubber and metal and they only used to last a very short while. So what we did, I had some brass ones made at an engineering place and they've been in there about six or seven years now and haven't been a problem. We son and I put a hole in there and put a grease nip on there so we could grease them. Like the other ones, the original ones didn't have grease nipples because the rubber used to wear out basically. The same ideals we got in these shackle pins they were, but much bigger. And they didn't last two minutes really. These brass ones are much better what we have made. And that rocker beam obviously does that and the axles, axles go over uneven ground. And they just slide, the end of the leaves just slide in and out there according to the level of the ground. As you can see we've put a grease nipple in the bolt so we can now grease the brass bushes, which is much better. So it's a fairly basic suspension then really isn't it? Yeah it's very basic but it does work very well. We occasionally have spring leaves go but that's no problem, we soon get a, we can get a spring off in a matter of about 20 minutes and we've got some old springs up there in the shed which we take leaves out and put in and repair it ourselves here don't have to send it away or anything it's back on the road again within an hour and a half or something like that Chris is proud of his wheel trims which are genuine Bedford coach parts. You see people when they're driving along they who might be interested in old lorries, they stop and watch you go by and, and watch you go away in the distance. They're amazed to see them. And we went on a site recently down to Aberthaw Power Station 
and uh, we drove in there and this couple of chaps there they saw us coming saw one of us come around the corner to load and uh, then next thing he said uh, he saw another one come around the corner which was quite unbelievable and he was very interested in the old lorries and he couldn't believe they were still running of course a lot of people think we don't do a lot of miles and we only use them use them locally but with our business which is supplying and delivering all weather riding arena materials sand stone bulk loads of rubber chips bulk loads of uh, wood chips and plastic granules we go in a radius of around about 180 to 200 miles of bath and lorries are used every day some days we do three to four hundred miles some days we do about 250 miles some days we might only do 150 miles but mainly it's an average of 300 miles a day which is quite good for this lorry which is 23 years old and that one over there is 15 years old that one over there was originally started out as an Arctic unit I bought that from London it was one of trans fleets immaculate condition I paid 200 2200 pounds for it and uh, we brought it home we then bought a smashed six-wheeler tipper Bedford TM with a Bedford 500 engine in it we took the cab off and took the body off and then we took the chassis to Bristol together with the tractor unit and truck trailer conversions converted it into a six-wheeler chassis and cab for us using the axles from the smash one extended the chassis by one and a half meters and used the out outer fixed plates from the smash one and put it on that one so all the holes came right for drilling for the spring hangers which made it quite easy for them and then that cost about two and a half thousand pound to have that done and uh, then we brought it back as a chassis and cab and then my son I know he fitted the tipper body from the smashed one onto that one which was only a tarmac and stone body and as you can see we extended the sides to make for carrying the bulker loads and obviously made the tailboard hinge from the very top instead of halfway down because that would be no good for tipping bulky loads so it had to hinge from the top so my son and I made all that and uh, that's got a Cummins L10 250 engine in it which when I had this Detroit two-stroke fitted in this when we fitted this one it was 300 it's 335 horsepower of course that I could leave my boy behind with the, only the 250 so we had to take that one to Avonmouth because he was complaining I was leaving behind everywhere and have that one uprated by Cummins and that one's now nearly 300 horsepower I think it's about 280 something like that so now he can keep up with me all right and uh, that's a very economical lorry to run very trouble free and does around 10 or 11 miles to the gallon whereas the old Detroit only does about sort of eight and a half to nine to the gallon which is a bit different but I like the Detroit and I wouldn't change it and as I said they're very economical to run and uh, we seem to get all over all the problems we have with them ourselves we don't ever have any outside repairs or anything done unless it's something like an engine rebuild but we don't bother with that we just get another engine and put in them like we did with this one we still have an anomaly in our legal system that lets older trucks travel at 60 miles an hour on motorways as Chris remarks when we get on the motorway that we don't speed because this this lorry is capable of 73 miles an hour uh, and that come one with the Cummins in due to it having diffs taking out the smash one and put in it with the combination of that and the gearbox it's got in it it's it'll, it'll go comfortably do at 82 miles an hour you might think that's a, not true but I can assure you it is it'll do 82 and this one will do 73 but of course we don't ever drive them like that on the motorway we sort of average about 50, 50 to 55 and we get better fuel economy like that and it's much less wear and tear on the lorry as well we find. It's not unusual for Chris and Alan to run together which as luck would have it happened while we were there.
As we're based near Kent, it's always a pleasant surprise to see him and his TM on the road. To see two TMs at once must be unique. For those who share the same interest in classic trucks that we have and live in the southwest, it must be heaven. Unfortunately, this is where we have to take our leave of Chris and Alan and rejoin Ken and Peter in Cheshire. There have been some changes at Chelford since our last visit, as Peter has now taken over from Ken, who's now retired, which makes Peter chief cook and bottle washer. Today, Pete and Ken are taking advantage of the fine weather to catch up on some maintenance, which requires some ERF parts on this occasion. We're running on this long drain oil now, which you can run to 45,000 kilometres. For changing, but I reckon if you we we're running on that, but changing it is about 25, so you're on the safe side all the time. Yeah, we've done a few big jobs on this wagon, but there's one thing we've never done, touch wood, and that's touch the engine. It's never had the top off. <coughs> this is when you get it down your sleeve. When you get it off, you can... You've seen Ken, <laughs> you seen Ken Johnson down there doing this. All of a sudden, he did come on him and he hit the bloody drain tub. Bounce back out and he'd be bloody covered in it. Like that, you know. Because he always used to wear them rubber gloves and it just slipped straight through his fingers once they were oil on. Pop the new ones up. Yeah, no, it won't bypass. First. Is there a difference in the two? Yeah. No. Is there? Yeah. One's a bypass filter, and one's your main filter. Oh, right. Yeah, they don't actually now, they just have the one. They only put one filter on them. The thread and the hole at the top here, the two different sizes. Can you see that? Now, if you look at the other one, you'll see the other one's bigger. Right, you got the other one there. Now, if you look at that one, you can see that the bigger. See. That's enough. Enough. With the oil change done, it's all hands on deck to help repair the window winder mechanism, which has suddenly given up the ghost. Yeah, it is 
Is it just that one arm on or is it two? It's all I've left, two. So I don't think there is this one. Well, oh, oh, yeah, well, what we need is something to hold that up in that position. Right, Piece of wood. Paintbrush with an oil. Oil. Tidying the sheet up. Looks good to me. That looks alright, it's all tightened up. Can you put the yeah. up? Well, they're all going to do now. Right. While we're at this stage, yeah. we're going to take this off now and see if we can adjust this hinge up. Make the door shut a bit better. Yeah. Actually, if that drops too much, you see the way the trouble is. You can catch it. Yeah. And it isn't really. Yeah. And the old bit, it's sort of pulling, and it can touch that if it's got a bit too much. Actually, all those doors have been wax oiled inside. It's dry now, but uh, there's wax oil on them, you know, like we did it when we... Because there were two fresh doors then. Oh, mm. When you open it, do you think it drops? I think we have got a bit out of it, but not a lot. Oh, go on, that'll do. Hang on. Go on that. Ah, that went. Peter's on a merry-go-round trip this morning with three loads of sand to go to some playing fields tucked away in the middle of a housing estate.
We presume it's to assist with the drainage. It's just five miles from the quarry, so it shouldn't take long. Pete decides the best way is to reverse over the canal bridge. This is one of those places that requires rigid trucks. This canal bridge wouldn't take kindly to 44 tons going over it. As Pete returns to the quarry for his second load, the next load arrives courtesy of this lift axle Volvo.
It's an early start for Peter and Ken today to replace a broken spring and prepare the chassis for spraying. They did the offside chassis last year. It's one of those time-consuming jobs that Peter will be glad to see the back of. Yeah, no, it's this one. Watch it. Watch where you're going. That's what I say. You. Peter explains how a side valve engine tool helps to keep the U-bolts in place during the initial tightening. Looks like I've got a clamp on it. Oh, to keep it in? Yeah. <laughs> That's obviously longer than it would be straight down, so they come together and then the U-bolts are loose. So yeah, you need to get them straight before you start, and then they'll ever come loose. And that's what your special tools for. And that's what that tool does, is doing. It's an old side valve valve spring compressor of all things, but it works for that. You just clamp it like that, you see. And just take them up evenly. I do have a... Uh, 
big socket barber, he's gone to school today. <laughs> and he undid them with me. Oops. We haven't time to do anything different other than run up. See? Well, things never go back quite the same as they came off, do they? Peter's crossed some wires on the rear light assembly. If I drop this, you'll have to edit the sound. <laughs> Lights again. Oh. Side lights, headlights. I'll show them off. Oh, yeah, well, you want the headlight on? Well, that's your fog. Show us the red light in the job. You can't see very well in the daylight, but it's there. Show them off. Now you've got a winker that way. With all the work done, Peter explains why getting parts for their particular TM presents problems. The cab tilt pump was replaced recently, and it's courtesy of an ARF E-Series. Oh, brilliant. Should have put this on a long time ago. I rebuilt all this. This is a new... It's partly what a new floor in this side. The other side was virtually all new. When we did the cab seven years ago now. Um, I had to replace these cross member these cross member here. All this here step or oh, part part of the, the inner slot what you might call the inner side gone and the floor section have gone. You can just about see the join there through the down there, runs down there. And these were metal and they were all rotten and it was all covered there. Unfortunately I've not got round to doing that but I've never but I thought well all they're doing is remote the dirt guards and really they're just gonna rot away and the brackets that mounted them to the floor had all rotted away. So these are pieces of plastic wing off the fur back end of a with the attractor unit they're off the old what were um broken wings in actual fact where the mud flap had but torn off them and I salvaged the rest and, and this is what I've made them out of and the same at the other side, just the other side as well. 
and it just st it stops the work all going up here and I mounted it further back onto the that edge of the cross member so it, you've got more cleaner area of the floor before it was more straight up here you see so all the muck used to hang in this section here and of course that's what rotted the floor originally this drop shaft is Normally you wouldn't have a, a, a what they call a torque tube of a drop shaft, anything like that diameter for a six-wheeler. Norm, normally there were only, um, said Aki's ERFs of this time, were only eight bolt flanges with three eighths bolts. These are 12 bolt flanges with 12 mil bolts, so everything is way over the top. Uh, the axles are tandem drive Eaton's, interaxle lock and also cross lock on this front drive, the rear axle's just um, hasn't got the cross lock on but this one has so you can virtually get out of anywhere with it oh air tanks again they were used to be mounted under here two tanks there this one's in the original place the two that were here I moved to one there because there was plenty of room for it and one inside the chassis there out of the way there was room for it again and these are again ERF aluminium tanks uh, taking off scrap vehicles perfectly serviceable so they were sprayed up put on and uh, they were all out of the muck from the back of the wheel which was the cause of all the problem they were just used to get covered in road salt from the wheel and they rotted away so eventually now they're all changed there was four tanks on it they're all now at ARF tanks suspension the design of it's fantastic absolutely trouble free apart from an odd broken spring which we've just done the problem is getting the parts now that that suspension again is heavier duty than any other I've seen. It's got ten leaf springs. Now the others I've only seen have got nine. They've got heavier bolts. They're uh, inch bolts in the um, spring eyes. The balance beams a lot bigger and heavier. Uh, they've got the extra helper rubbers on them as well that the other ones didn't have. So. I just can't get parts because this wasn't as common as the, earl the earlier ones with the lighter duty stuff. You can still get bits for them, but I can't get bits for these. I waited six months for a, a shackle bush. Uh, fortunately, at the moment, with the none of them gone, but there's, I know one is on its way and I need to get another one soon for, for MOT, really, but that, that's about it. This plate here used to come loose. The timing base plate from the engine block and uh, oh the oil had just run out of it you'd lose a gallon a day when they were really bad and this got to that stage so we uh, what Cummings did they modified the bolts and put a, like a, a cone washer on them, quite a heavy cone washer on the back of them so that as you tighten the bolt up it acted like a spring and, and, and stopped the bolts came loose in fact that's what the problem was that one of the bolts heads was actually rubbing on the back of the cam drive gear so that had come right out and it was running out of this point here where the camshaft is. Since of which it's been we've done it and put all new seals in the modified gasket, the modified bolts. And it's it's we did that oh god. Six years ago and it's it's still as dry as bone now. In fact to the point of things are going rusty on the engine, there's no oil leaks on it at all. And that that's all we've ever had to do with the engine. Oh, it's done well over a million kilometres, this wagon. Well over. Um, my, my dad will tell you exactly, really. Uh, we've had, well, we've had this, we're on now the third tachograph. But we had, they weren't brand new when they were put in, they were recon, so there was mileage on them. Um, but we, we have got it noted down, we could tell you exactly what it's done. As, well, what it's done while we've had it. I mean, what it's done before, I mean, that could be a second clock, but I think it was about 300 something thousand on it when we first bought it. Um, and what year is it, this? It's a 1984. Um, again, it's probably really one of the last lot because they, were, they stopped making them in 1986. Well, I've got to keep it going till I got another one. I think the problem really is that the supply of parts, the availability of the parts and the same old trouble as cabs of that era had like the Sednak and it's the cab rot 
I mean, I've done it up once, big style, I'm not doing it again. It's, it's just too much work because you're off the road with it, so while you're off, you're not earning. So my idea is to just keep it straight, keep it looking presentable, get it through another test, that'll give me a little more time spell to uh, get another vehicle, and a lot newer one, and one that I can know I can get parts for, whether new second hand or whatever, preferably new, but I mean, if you can get second hand parts that are serviceable, then they're as good as new ones in a lot of cases. Do you have the same trouble Chris has with the brakes going dry? I did at start when we first when we first got the vehicle. Yeah, we did. But um, the problem with that was the back plates had dropped it away. Um, so I stripped them all down, put new back plates on, sandblast, stripped the expanders down, sandblasted them out, made sure everything was free, and put them back on. What the, what you mustn't we found you mustn't do with these is adjust them up tight. If you adjust them up like you do a normal brake, where you tighten the wheel up till it won't turn, then back it off till it run, turns free. When you get to that stage, you must go another couple of clicks. That way you've got that mo bit more movement, because there's then many moving parts. If you're hardly moving at all, they soon seize you. Let them out move a little bit more, and we've, we don't have any trouble with the brake sticking. Plus, I found that if you do the expanders and all the uh, equalising bars that run in the back shoes, I've got some proper locky expander grease and I've, since then it doesn't dry up in there with the brake dust. It stays as, I can strip them down now and it will still be soft. So I think that's 75% of the cure of the sticking brakes. So it was a matter of having to find another body. Well, at the time we used to do quite a lot of pallet work. So we needed to find another drop sided tipping body. Well, they're like ends teeth. Um, for every drop-sided one, there must be a thousand all-welded ones. I mean, they are a rare item. Not so much on short ones, but finding one 20 foot long was a was a, a, a real task. And eventually, after about 18 months of looking, I did find one in the scrapyard when I was looking for something else, in fact. And it was this body was originally 25 foot long, so you can imagine another five foot on it. And it had three sideboards in length, not two like we've got now. We had a new backboard, all this back pillar was beefed up and renewed because we would be doing a lot of tipper work and it really wasn't strong enough for a tipper. The actual body came off an eight wheeler said in Atkinson and it had never been used as a tipper for years because the actual ram was taken off the vehicle and it had been bolted down solid to the chassis because it was used as a brick wagon. This Arklid transport tanker has just delivered a bulk load of sand to the bagging plant here, which will be sorted into bags of various sizes. This is where Peter's multi-sided tipper comes in.
Well, that's it from Somerset and Cheshire. Except to thank Alan, Chris, Peter and Ken for their enthusiasm and patience during our filming.